I want to share this morning something that I, well, I was going to say that would wrap up the last few weeks. Um, I don't think we'll ever wrap that up. I think um, we could talk about that on and on, just about forever. But I want to bring a kind of closure. And um, I want to share a story that I'm certain I've shared with you before. I, I just know that. Because it's from Luke chapter 15. And as I've said to many of you many times, I began meditating on Luke 15 when I was around 14, 13 even, but say 14 years old. And I, I've been there almost every day of my life in one way or another. Normally, I have preached from the lost son, well, the lost sons, the last of the parables. But I want to look at the first parable because in, in this chapter, <clears throat> Jesus was actually answering religion. He was answering the Pharisees. And so you, you have his own self-portrait. Do, do you understand that? Jesus is giving to us in this chapter by these parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost sons. In, in this chapter, he's giving to us. This is terribly important. It's his own self-portrait. He is telling them who he is. And he's giving his own understanding of his mission as to why he's here. So we don't have to make anything up. We don't have to go into great uh, debate. He's simply telling us and telling us in very simple stories who he is and why he's here. And we've been doing that ourselves in the last three weeks. And so take everything I've said in the last three weeks and we're going to find it in this parable and I hope in that sense, wrap it up. And when we come to the shepherd in this story, it's not only speaking of Jesus, because Jesus is Son of God, a person of the Trinity, and the Trinity cannot be broken. And therefore, where I find the Son, there I find the Father, there I find the Holy Spirit. And so in this parable, there are words in this parable that take us right back to the Father's heart. Um, other times it is blatantly Jesus it's speaking of, and at other times it speaks of the work of the Holy Spirit, all in these few verses. So hold that in mind. Let me just read it. Um, and, and you remember it was because he was eating with tax collectors who were the scum of the earth, um, and, and they were in the employ of Rome, the army of occupation, and, and along with them, there were sinners, and they would be your regular crowd that would be completely kicked out of the synagogue long ago. And, and now Jesus is sitting down having a meal, which in that culture, and in many cultures of the world today, having a meal is to have a covenant of solidarity. Jesus was saying that he was their friend, which was a very strong word, almost kinfolk in those days. A friend, it's someone who would die for you. And, and, and so he is putting all this together in a meal. And everybody understood what was happening. And so religion is outraged because religion lives in the world of us and them. And there's few of us and many of them. And, and we don't talk to them because we might get polluted. And so the Pharisees are angry and they say, this man receives sinners. You know, you've, you've got to be around religion to know how to say that word, sinners. You talk it with a sneer and eats with them. He's a covenant of solidarity. And so in the light of that, he told them this parable. What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in open pasture, go after the one which is lost until he finds it? 
And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends, his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. And you know how much I hate that word because it comes from the most corrupt time of church history. It, I mean, repent, the English word means to do penance over and over and over again, uh, which of course that is not the meaning of the word at all. The word in Greek is metanoia, which means, and let me read it, over one sinner who exchanges his mind, exchanges his mind with the mind of Jesus. And he says, more so than over 99 righteous persons. And this time Jesus is being sarcastic. He's talking of the religious. 99 righteous persons who need no change of mind. Okay, that's the story. And I, I'm going to assume that you know the story. In fact, I'm going to assume you pretty well know the whole chapter. And so I might make reference without apology. The most arresting thing about all these parables in Luke 15 is the one. It's the one lost sheep. And in this parable, it is emphasized because it speaks of he leaves the 99, which, uh, among other things, but it, it means this one sheep is worth the entire flock. You get that? He, he's ready to leave the 99, uh, and of course he would leave them with uh, other shepherds, but he would leave them in order to give his sole undivided attention to find one sheep. It, it is meaning that each one of us are pursued by Jesus as if we were the only one. This is so important. Salvation is not just a blob, a great big uh, save the world. Uh, he is saving the world, but he does so individually, one by one. Each person, each one of us, we are to him as if we were the only one. And therefore, we can speak to him as if we had this most individual, personal, and only relationship. This is intimacy. This is the love which the Bible is telling us about. Um, and Paul in Galatians says, he loved me and gave himself for me. Now, that's a tremendous statement that, that he is saying that the entire saving work of Jesus was accomplished for me. And it's as if from the cross, the, the eyes of Jesus dance with joy as he sets his eyes upon you and says, I'm doing this solely as you. Now, again, I've said a number of times, when you, you think of the cross and the sufferings of Jesus, see your face in the face of Jesus. That's the only way we can understand it. So this one but this one lost sheep, that, that's where the parable begins, that the sheep has become lost. And that, that's the rest of the story because the sheep is lost. But that, that presumes that there is a pre-story. You know what I mean? There's, there's a story here that hasn't been written, but it's assumed because it uses that word lost. It means that this sheep that's gone lost was, in fact, loved. Um, and, and that may be strange to our Western ears, that, that a shepherd would love a sheep. Uh, the, in our Western culture, they don't love the sheep. They prepare them to butcher. Uh, but in the East, where, of course, this parable is set, the... A shepherd, and I would have to use the word love. 
I've been there, I've watched this, it's not secondhand. The shepherds in Israel especially, but in the near Middle East as far as I know, they, they have a pet name for every sheep. And when they would call the flock together, they simply walk away and they send out the names of the sheep almost in a sing-song voice. They're calling each sheep by name and there can be a hundred sheep in the flock, as in this case. Um, and, and so as the name is called, the sheep will run and, and follow the shepherd. There's a, there is, there is a love relationship. The sheep is a pet but it's more than a pet. These shepherds, uh, what makes the shepherd is that he will lay down his life for the sheep, unquestioned. And so th this sheep that's lost, because he uses the word lost, it, it means it's one of the loved. It means this sheep is owned. That is, it's not a wild sheep. Um, you cannot lose a wild sheep sheep. Do you follow me? Um, we, we have here in Texas um, lots of wild cats uh, and um, we call them feral cats. Well, they, they are wild, which means they were born in the wild. They're owned by nobody. And so when such a cat turns up on the ranch, we look immediately, has it got a collar? Because sometimes a neighbor's cat will come, but they, they've always got a collar. They always um, look toward humans they're used to. But the, the feral cat, no, that's a one. You can't lose a feral cat, you can't, but possible. They turn up and they'll disappear, and they'll turn up and they'll disappear. You never lose them. You can't lose a wild cat. You can only lose a cat that's yours. It's got a name, you see. And this sheep was owned. It wasn't a wild sheep. Or he couldn't have called it my sheep. You understand? It wouldn't have been my sheep. It would have been a sheep. But he calls this my sheep. This is a loved sheep. It's an owned sheep. It's got a name, good grief. It's got a name. When, when you've got a name, it means you are unique. You, you are known as special, you see. You're not just an it. It's not, hey, you. You've got a name. And, and when you're talking of sheep, then, then it's got a special place in the heart of the shepherd, and it's got a special place in the flock. It belongs. It matters. That's a big word. It matters. Feral cats don't matter. You never know if they're there or not. And, and um, therefore, they, they, they don't matter. You don't have a space in your life for them. You, you, you don't put out the milk or, or the, the food for them because, well, I don't know if they'd be. They, they, they have no matter in my life. If they show up, they show up. If they don't, they don't. Um, one, one of the greatest... Um, I, I think essence of loneliness is that the person believes, and maybe it's true, they don't matter to anybody, really. I mean, they can go home at night or not, because there's nobody there to say, I was waiting for you, you see? And so you, love means that you matter to someone. You have a place in their life and their heart. You have a name that identifies you. See, this, this sheep is no wild sheep out in the wilderness. This is a my sheep. This is a sheep of the name. It's owned. It's loved. Do, do you realize this? Many people don't. That you belong to the Holy Trinity, whether you know it or not. You are, says the psalm, the sheep of his pasture. Why so? Because you were created. Created, and that means that the Creator has a right to you. He made you. You see, there was a time when you were not. You, you do understand that, don't you? There was a time when you were not. You did not be. 
Yeah, and, and then you be, you came into existence and you were, says the scripture, called into existence. And, and you were not called into existence to see what would happen, a sort of evolutionary God that starts you off and says, now let's watch and see what it does. No, <clears throat> God wouldn't be so daft as that. Um, he, he, it says that he had a purpose there was a reason you were called into existence by your creator because A, he loved you, and therefore it was love that creator birthed you. But love had a purpose. It was a love purpose. And if we had time, we've touched on it in the last three weeks. There in Ephesians, it speaks of that purpose that was before time. So we're not talking about something that happened after you were made. It is, this was the blueprint. This is the kind of creature you were intended, purpose, planned, intended to be. And that is, it says, that you were intended to be adopted into the Holy Trinity family. And adopted is about the only word you could use, because adopted means bringing someone who's out of the family into the family. And, and, and this you were started, you created. Holy Trinity is unbegun God, but you had a beginning, and the beginning was caused by this God. And so he had to bring you, bring you a creature into the Holy Trinity family to, as Peter says, be a partaker of divine nature, that you would be a son, a daughter of God who could look face to face with the Father and call him Daddy Abba. That's why you were created. So this adoption is a lot more than bringing a stranger in and hope you fit. This is that he's placing his very life in you. He is bringing you into the status of his child. He's embracing you with his love. He's filling you with his love. That was the purpose. And it's plain written there in Ephesians and also um, throughout in Romans 8 and in um, 2 Timothy 1, it, it is this face-to-face -face with the Father. That's why he created you. In, in fact, in Romans 8, it says you were to, to have be an heir of God. God himself would give his very self to you and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. That is, as, as Jesus, so you. That was the purpose. That was the purpose. And it was all done before time. So this, as I again, was the blueprint. That was your place. It was your name. He called you, called you, and it by name. He says to one of the prophets, "I knew you before you were born. I knew your name." Do, do you realize that you are no stranger to God? You might think so, but you're no stranger to God. But this gives meaning. It gives context to the word lost. Lost. You see, lost means that you are absent from your place, the place where you're supposed to be, the place where you fit, you, the, the, you, you matter, and therefore you, you are not where the person was waiting for you to be. And you're, you're, you're lost to that relationship of belonging. That's the big word. You belong. And because you belong, you have a place. Because you belong, you are loved. Because you belong, you have a name. And to be lost is to have slipped away from that. Um, you, you've abandoned the blueprint of your place. And the word in the scripture is you have entered a, a world of the futile. And the word futile means going around and around in aimless, meaningless circles without any form or fashion or meaning. You've forgotten who you are. You've forgotten your identity. That's what last is. 
And, and it doesn't happen. E even in the original Lost, in which Adam led the way, um, it, it's not so much an intentional act. It isn't that you stand up one day and say, well, I'm going to get lost. No, usually lost means there's been a distraction. And if you were a sheep, uh, it would be the thought that pops into your head and says, look at that patch of grass over there. It looks jolly interesting. And then look at that path. I wonder where it leads. I wonder what's around that corner. What's over there? And before you know it, you've gone here, you've gone there, and you forgot how you got there, but it doesn't really matter because there's so many wonderful, dazzling things over there and over there that are calling you to go here and there. And so I say, it wasn't so much an intentional act. It was by just disassociating with the flock and the shepherd and, and just wandering off. And the Bible says into the wilderness. Now to a Jew, an Israelite of the days that we're looking at, and you have to do that because Jesus spoke this parable over against it. So he assumed everybody understood what he understood that, and in those days, the wilderness was not merely that um, uncultivated land or uninhabited land. Oh, it, it, was, it had many other, shall I say, spiritual ideas. Um, a lot of it was superstition, but that's beside the point. People really believed that the wilderness, and probably first of all, they would believe this because it was locked into their own history. You remember the Israelites had a scapegoat. Do you remember the scapegoat where they laid their hands on the animal and transferred their sins to the animal? And the poor thing was taken out into the wilderness and let go. And it was lost in the wilderness on purpose. And so the people had in their mind the wilderness was a place of my guilt. Uh, the wilderness was a place of facing the accusation of my guilt. It's the place of my shame. It's, it's where all the sins that were mine were taken and now I'm, I'm drowning in them. It's like all my sins come back to me and say I'm yours. The wilderness, they were terrified of the wilderness. It was a place where they believed, and I say again, it's beside the point whether it's true, they believed it, that it was the place where demons lived. And, and you might remember Jesus' reference, when a demon's cast out, it goes into the wilderness and then comes back again. And, and um, you speak into that. And, and so the place in the wilderness was looked upon as sheer terror. It was a place of darkness. But then, of course, physically, it was a place where predators roamed. And a predator, especially to a sheep, what was a terrifying thought. And, of course, it was a place of starvation because it might have been grass that tempted the sheep to get into the wilderness. There's no grass in the wilderness. It's a place of desert. It's a place of rock. It's a place of precipice and cliffs and, and, and spree and rocks and Danger, danger on all sides because you are inevitably going to hit the rocks. You're going inevitably to go through thorn bush and, and cactus and, and it scrapes your skin and oh yeah. And of course, wilderness, you know the place, if you're from the desert southwest, you might have seen it, um, the place of mirage. You know the mirage? Have you seen the mirage? Where, where you, you, you would swear that over there there is a tree, over there there is water, and you will go toward it, but it's not over there. It's a mirage, and you're only getting deeper into the wilderness and closer to starvation and death, even though you thought that was going to be your food. Hallucinations, the wilderness, it, it's, it's a place of lies. 
It, it, it beckons, beckons the, the sheep. Come, come, there's so much here to discover, you see. And, and, and so the sheep goes into the wilderness following the lies, distracted, and distraction upon distraction. It's interesting that Jesus portrays much of the wilderness and its religion. And you remember in, in John chapter 10, verse 10, he says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. <clears throat> I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That is not talking about the devil. <clears throat> is talking about religion. That was the whole, if you read the whole of John chapter 10, that's what he was talking about. He says religion comes and, and it distracts you and religion steals from you life. It, it ends up destroying you. That's religion. Um, in, in fact, you could say, if you look at that, he says religion has brutalized you. And actually that is the word or words like it, that he, when he looked on the people and, and he's going to teach them and heal them, and it says he was moved with compassion because the way religion had clubbed them and brutalized them. It's true. The, and how is it, how is it that religion can be the place of the wilderness? Well, it, it distracts. And, and how can I put this? The distractions of religion hide you from Jesus himself. Now, do you get it? What I'm saying is that religion is actually it's the place that you would hide from God. And that sounds strange to people that you get involved in religion to hide from God, but it's a very safe place to hide and very oh, it's such a lie, because everything about religion sounds like God. So you can be deceived into thinking that you are with him, when all the time it's a lie and you're hiding from him. What do I mean? I mean, religion says to us, do this good work. It's a great program, and you will be involved in this good work and be part of this great religious program or come to these meetings. We've got lots of meetings all the week, meetings for this and meetings for that and meetings for that. And it's all about the work of God. And then come and dedicate yourself to God. Present to him all of your best tries. And we'll give you the guidelines so that you can try according to the guidelines and try to please God. And, and why not read through the Bible in a year? If you gallop through it, you won't remember any, of course, but you, you'll have the satisfaction you read through it in a year. And above all, you've got to try to be like Jesus. Now, you probably realize that none of that is very good at all, but with many people, that is their Christianity. And do you realize by doing all of that and being involved in all of that and believing that that is somehow pleasing God, you have lost Jesus? I didn't mention him, did I, except right there. And then you just got to try to be like him, which means he's way up there somewhere. Um, all these, yes, good distractions they hide us from Jesus himself, which means they hide us from a personal and intimate love of God. <clears throat> you talk to any of those people about an intimate knowing that God loves me and they might run away from you. And of course, it has taken away from us the freedom the incredible freedom, the delight of God in who you are, that he calls you to be yourself in his love. And you're free to be yourself because you're loved for who you are. And that's terrifying to religion because they live by rules. And uh, See, religion feels safe. 
in pursuing good things while effectively hiding from this transparency uh, of, of being known, the freedom of being in the real presence of love. Because to such of necessity, it's the way it is. I'm so busy doing religious stuff <clears throat> that the Father, God the Father, well, most was, I don't know, I don't know who the God the Father is. He's just up there somewhere. God up, 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 aloof, remote. And, and, and Jesus is up too, didn't he ascend or something? Uh, uninvolved. Well, we feel very safe because we're in control down here doing good works. But it's a false security because actually it's imprisoning us and using us. But do you see the tragedy? We don't even know we're lost. It would be an insult to tell these people they're lost. The sheep didn't know it was lost. The sheep didn't know it was lost. It's just on a journey sort of thing. Not lost. The essence of being lost is not knowing that I'm lost. I mean, this sheep was not searching for the shepherd, that's for sure. Nor when the shepherd shows, does this sheep run with relief and say, finally you've come. No, it's lost. And, and lost means that it's fascinated by the myriad alluring distractions in a terrible wilderness. The only one in this story who knows the sheep was lost is the shepherd. Think about that. The only person who knows you and I were lost is Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And to them, that is so, <clears throat> well, what's the word? I, I can't find a strong enough word. To, to, to think that I am lost from my meaning. I am lost from my purpose. I'm lost from my blueprint, and I don't know it. I don't even know my real name before God. I don't know, I don't know, and I don't know that I don't know. I think I do know. <laughs> I know nothing, see, it's very, but he knows you're lost. And that is the driving, yeah, maybe that's the good word, the driving movement of Father and Son and Holy Spirit that will not allow anything to stand between you and them. They will come to find you, come to rescue an unwilling, unwanting, ignorant sheep. That's what you have in this story. You see, the word lost doesn't only mean what I've just said, as I pointed out before. The word lost means because you matter, because you are loved. It mean, Lost means that someone, someone so precious, so valued, of such personal worth to the owner, they're going to come and find you. And, and, and the, the more precious you are, the greater the search. And, and the search we're talking about here has no comparison. And so the shepherd comes into the wilderness to find his sheep. He's not coming to find a wild sheep. I've got to emphasize that. He's not on a search like some sort of hunter for a wild sheep so he can add it to the flock. He's not out. If that were the case, he'd be out there to capture sheep. Do you understand? If he's after wild sheep to bring them into his flock, then he would have to go out as a hunter to capture them. But this shepherd is going not to find a strange sheep or a wild sheep, but his sheep, my sheep, my named sheep, my sheep that matters. Please understand that. 
Because I know the church has told you over and over again that until you're born again, God doesn't even know your name. I heard it. Don't get me started. But I, I heard God is talking about someone who made their decision for, for Christ last week. And the, the person said, a person of authority, a person, a minister, you might even know him. And he says, well, now God can love you. What? do you mean? Do you mean that God now is coming to be introduced to this new stranger? No, you have been the beloved of God since before you were created. There's been a purpose and a plan from before you were created, and that purpose was to include you into the Holy Trinity family. And you, yes, lost, terribly lost, in an awesome wilderness. But he never forgot you. He came instead to find you. And when he finds you, the face of God, Father, Son, and Spirit light up the whole cosmos and said, I found you. You're mine. Oh, boy. You could stop there, really. Um, and, of course, when he says, I found my sheep. Now, I, I know, please don't get upset. Just hear what I'm saying. Um, if the shepherd says, I, shepherd, found, I, I, I found my sheep, it, it means that the sheep didn't make a decision to join the flock. It did not look at the shepherd and say you're doing the jolly good job, I think I'll accept you as my personal shepherd. Please, I'm not giving a caricature here. This is what we're faced. This is why the church is being emptied. People are leaving by the thousands because there's nonsense. As if this stranger, a person who's alien to God, and he comes and makes his decision that God should be on his team. No, this is a sheep who is lost, but it matters. It's a sheep who is lost, but it's precious and loved. And the shepherd comes to find what is his. You say, well, the sheep's in the wilderness, belongs to the wilderness. Don't be stupid. No, of course not. <laughs> Does a kidnapped child belong to the kidnapper? No. Does your jewelry that the thief stole now belong to the thief? No. <laughs> Just because the sheep has been swallowed up in the wilderness and deluded and blinded, he's still the shepherd's sheep. Still has the value, the worth, and the preciousness. Careful how you pray for your friends and beloved and relatives. Be careful. You, you are praying for someone who already belongs. You are praying for someone who is already beloved. Join the Father. He calls his lost sheep, not wild sheep. The value of this sheep to the shepherd is defined. How, how much is the sheep worth? The sheep is worth the life of the shepherd. You ever thought about that? The shepherd is going into the same territory as the sheep, is open to the same dangers. And you don't understand the story unless you understand the risk. The shepherd said, if necessary, I'll give my life, but I'm going to get that sheep. And to do so with joy. Did you notice how many times joy rejoices there? The shepherd is driven by the joy that I'm going to find my sheep. That's why it says he will go until he finds it. He's going to join it in its lostness. And from there, he's going to bring it home. And that's the gospel. That's what we've been talking about these weeks. The Trinity loves us, values us. And all these are human words that fall hopelessly short of what I'm trying to say. The value placed upon us is God the Son came into our wilderness, 
into our lostness, God became human and came with joy that he will unite with us and bring us home to the purpose for which we were created. It's interesting that Jesus spent so much time in the Gospels talking of himself as the good shepherd. And then this parable, which is almost the same thing. Do you realize he was horrifying the Pharisee listeners? Because he was quoting directly from an ancient prophecy, Ezekiel 34. Uh, I don't know if you realize it, when Jesus said he was the good shepherd, he was claiming to be God here, looking for his sheep, according to Ezekiel. When he gave this story, he, the whole story is Ezekiel 34. It was written, what, 500 years before Jesus came. Let me read it quickly. Ezekiel 34, uh, verse 11 Thus says the Lord God, the I am Elohim. He says, behold, listen, behold, I myself will search for my sheep and I will seek them out as a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep. So I the Lord God will care for my sheep, will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the scattered, bind up the broken, strengthen the sick. Whoa, that was written 500 years before Jesus came, where I am God said, I will come. Jesus said, here I am, I'm the good shepherd. I am come into the wilderness. And interestingly, that whole chapter is spoken um, over against the religious of the day and, and condemning them and saying that you don't care at all for the sheep. But God says, then I will come and do it myself. I will come. And so the son of God, enters our wilderness, he becomes man, he becomes human. And why, why the son? Because he's the creator, it was through him the father created. The son, Jesus, is called the upholder. He's said to be the one in whom all things hold together. He's got a unique and relational place in creation. Every tree is held together by the word of Jesus. You are held together, you say. And so he's already got a relationship to you. I know you didn't know that, maybe. When I woke up to all this, I sure didn't know it. But, but it's true. Every atom of your body is held together by the word of Jesus. And, and, and he uses these words of find. I've, I've got to find my sheep. And then he said, uh, at another time, Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. All words that come from that prophecy. They're, they're strong words. They're intentional words. It isn't say I'm going for a casual walk in the park. <laughs> no, he says, I am on a mission. Jesus, incarnation, God joining the human race is a mission. In fact, find, seek, they're words you use for a treasure hunt. It's when you're, you're, you're going to find something very precious and you, you'll dig up a whole jolly mountain to get to it if necessary. You'll lay hold on that prize at any cost. God comes to find us. He's not a divine tourist. He's not walking 10 feet above the earth, looking down at us saying, look at me, look what I can do. He's 100% beside us, shoulder to shoulder, searching, seeking. My heart coming to find the core of my being to lay hold upon me. He joined us. He joined us in the wilderness. He didn't say, sheep, if you'll come to the edge here. He didn't come in a hazmat suit with a mask. Social distancing, good grief. 
He comes right to the sheep where it is, and the sheep is in a hostile mood. It's left him. It's gone into the wilderness. You could say it's lost its mind. And he comes. And he joins us at our very worst. That's what we meant at the cross. He joined the human race when all the human race would do would tear him limb from limb. That's where he saved us, right there. Came to the worst. Because he tracked the footsteps of the sheep as he enters into the wilderness. Have you ever seen a tracker? These shepherds, he didn't just wander out in the wilderness, dazed and saying, sheepy, sheep, sheepy, sheep. He's a tracker. He knew what he was looking for. You know, in a mud patch there, he looks for a hoof print. There on a thorn bush, he sees a great chunk of wool that's been torn off of the sheep, you know. Maybe drips of blood where the sheep has been wounded. He knows what he's looking for. And he himself, and you have to understand this, no shepherd would go into such a wilderness without himself getting hurt. He's got to track the same way the sheep went. He's got to put his feet almost in the footsteps of the sheep. And yeah, <laughs> he, he's actually taking the place of the sheep. He, he's joining the sheep. With, with faith in his father that this wondrous conspiracy of love is going to come to its goal. We're going to find the sheep. He stands in our wilderness, but he stands against all the lies of the darkness that have blinded us. We got sucked in. He stands in the same wilderness, in the same darkness, but refuses to believe the lies. Keeps his eyes on his father. It's what we were trying to say these days. The fact is, the shepherd, to all intents and purposes, became the sheep. That is, he goes exactly where it is. He's exposed to all the same dangers, open to all the same lies. And he comes into the wilderness to the bottom of the darkness of our lostness, where we were. When, when that shepherd finally came to where the sheep was, I, I, it's in my head. I don't know if I can say it, but it, it's... You, you get an image there. Here they are. There's a sheep and the shepherd. And, and they're tied together for reality. If you can see this vast wilderness around them, and there's two, two figures, a sheep and a shepherd. And, and, and the shepherd he is tied together with the sheep. He's as much as risk in that moment as the sheep. Who knows what predator is there that can deal with a shepherd as well as a sheep? And, and, and if the shepherd is not strong enough to overcome the powers of the wilderness, the sheep dies. The, the life of the sheep is tied up with the life of the shepherd. Do, do you understand? If Jesus hadn't made it through to the resurrection, we would not be here. If the shepherd conquers the wilderness by getting the sheep out, now the sheep lives. The two are entwined as one and have a common outcome. Do you understand? That's what we mean when we say Christ is our life. I don't mean that the shepherd is going to give you some good advice. It's not he's going to point the way. Your life is entwined with his life and what he did, you did. If he comes out, you come out. A lot more than the religious Jesus. You see, this is, I, I hope you hear this, that when he comes upon the sheep, when he finally finds it, where it, it, it is where it ought not to be, and it's in a mood it ought not to be in, that the sheep is at its worst. And what does it say? He was filled with joy. Oh. He is filled with joy. This is so different to what 
people look upon the cross and coming to find us, it's filled with joy. It is so would excited be the word? <laughs> Limitless excitement has found his sheep. So here he is, the shepherd, utterly one with the sheep, yet beside himself with joy because he's found the sheep. He's got his hands on it. He's found the sheep at its worst. He's got it. So you see, he is lost. The shepherd at that point is lost in the sheep's lostness. He's where the sheep is, lost. But the difference is the shepherd is there by choice. Jesus joined the human race by choice. Didn't wake up one day and find himself here. He loved me and gave himself for me. That's intention, that's choice. And he may be inside the lostness of us. He well looks out of our eyes, comes into our feelings, is in our darkness. Yes, he's absolutely there. But the difference is not only he came there by choice, but he is the way out. It's what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. And he says, we're out of here. Lost. Yes, he joined our lostness, but in being lost, he knows the way out. This is the reason he came. This is the reason for the parable. I found my sheep. This is it. I'm going to say it again. He doesn't go back saying, look, I found a sheep out there while I was walking. See, no. Jesus doesn't come on you and say, well, I, I don't know who you are, but we'll get to know each other. No. He looks right at you. He knows you. Knows you by name. You matter to him. His eyes light up like a million suns. And he says, I found you. Found you. Calls him by name. Not as an outsider. Doesn't, doesn't look at its ragged, bruised appearance. Doesn't look at it as an alien from the wilderness because that's what it looked like. But he called it in accord with his true identity of belonging, of being owned. And he would call it by name when he first said it. And that's saying, You are included. Do you understand that? You're included. And I've come to remind you of that. I've come to wake you up to that. I've come to get a hold of you and bring you back to where you belong, out of the clutches with the darkness. I've come to tell you that you're precious. I've come to bring you back to sanity, to your inclusion in the flock that you belong. And if I know anything about sheep, <clears throat> the sheep did not run to greet the shepherd. There's no sigh of relief on the sheep's part. He's full of fear now. Wilderness has got a hold of him. But the Bible, what is love? Sometimes we think we could spend 20 weeks just defining what God's love is. What one attribute of God's love is kindness. Just plain kindness and gentleness. The shepherd would approach that sheep with gentle kindness, N not condemning the sheep for fear. But I'll give you this, he approached that sheep, well, the whole journey, and certainly at the end now, he approached that sheep without the sheep's permission. Why? Because it was his sheep. We've got some weird ideas in religion in America that somehow we've got to give God permission before he'll even look at us. We've got to call on him and convince him we're worth it. Oh, the deranged mind of the darkness, the dementia of sin, the idiot thoughts we have. But he knows that. And he loves you as you are, not as you should be, as you are. 
He's come to save our minds. He's come to pour light into our dementia. And so with gentleness and kindness, and if necessary, let's sit down and just get used to me again. Come on. He didn't do something for the sheep, which again, many people believe that Jesus did something for us and then gave us this something he did for us. We call it salvation or eternal life. It is it that he gives to us. Then he sort of disappeared, sort of, I don't know. But he gives you this it. Why, just a minute. No, he didn't. He put it in the shop window of the local religion. And, and, and he said, I've made it possible. You see, I, mean, I, I did this for you. See it? See it? That, that thing there called salvation, called eternal life. I made it possible for you to get out of it. But if, there's a cost, see, if you will follow me out, if, and if you be sorry and beat yourself up for all the sin that you've done, and also abandon the wilderness mindset, then you can have it. Yeah. I know you tried before. I know. I know you tried before. Well, you weren't sorry enough. You didn't have enough faith in me. You still, you know I was. Try again. There's another appeal on Wednesday night. Isn't that sick? No. He didn't do anything for us. He gave himself to us. And himself is the salvation. It's not something I've got to get a hold of. It's him. He puts his arms around me and he saves me. That's the cross. The shepherd himself was the way home. And please, okay, let me do it. Just humor me. He didn't tell the sheep, you've got to try and be like the shepherd. See what I, I, I went through this wilderness. You can, you can do the same. You can do the same. You've got to try and be like. And, and if you stand at a cross, so you just ask yourself, what would the shepherd do? See, no. The shepherd himself is the way home. The shepherd himself is the salvation. And he doesn't ask permission of the sheep because the sheep belongs to him. In fact, that shepherd is the endorsement of the belonging. He, built, he brings into the wilderness belonging, the fact of his being there and the fact he's come into the sheep's world. That, that, that is the, the endorsement. You belong. Look, I'm here. I wouldn't be here if you didn't belong. Because what about that? Because shepherds do not bring wild sheep into the fold. No, he comes because we, the human race, belong to him. He's there. And he is the endorsement of our belonging just by being there. He canceled, actually, he canceled lostness by being there. As soon as he was there, the sheep isn't lost anymore because the shepherd's here. You could say that the futile agenda of the sheep died at that moment as the shepherd picks up the sheep, dies to all its ideas of being an independent sheep in the wilderness, died. And there's a resurrection takes place as he finds himself on the shoulder of the sheep. And the shepherd, one with the sheep, is now going to, as the sheep, walk the sheep backwards to where it belongs. He's gonna take the same path, only take it backwards. Take him home. Again, humor me. Shepherd didn't go there to correct the sheep's bad behavior. Rather, he became the sheep's new behavior. He carried him out. Nor is there a mention of punishment for leaving. He doesn't beat the sheep up. Gentle, kind, 
holds, puts on shoulder. Nor does he announce the sheep is forgiven and it's now not going to be slaughtered and eaten. That is if you will follow me out of the wilderness. No, none of that. There, there's shepherd justice. And the shepherd justice is that he enters into the lostness in order that the sheep may enter into the intimacy and the freedom of the shepherd, a union relationship with the shepherd. And so he puts the sheep on his shoulder. Give me five more minutes. He, he puts the sheep, that means around his neck, like a scarf. You might have seen pictures of it. It's the sheep now is, is around the neck and, and they would tie the, the legs in the front because the sheep is still in a state of fear and is liable to jump. So they, they tie the legs. That means that the face of the sheep is right here, right here. You talk about face to face. Remember that? In the Holy Trinity, Father is face to face with the Son. Eye to eye, a love that comes in, all in the face to face of the Holy Spirit. Face to face. You could say in absolute correct, the word in, in the New Testament. I am in you, you are in me. That sheep on the shoulder of, of the shepherd was in the shepherd. That is, they moved together. They share the same history together, every detail. As the shepherds, so the sheep. And face to face with the shepherd, that's the identity of the sheep. It discovers itself, its true self, in the eyes of the shepherd. But again, do I have to keep on? I think so. We need to be reminded. The shepherd doesn't say to the sheep, grovel. Yet stupid sheep, make me come in this wilderness. No. Only religion is into groveling. If your idea of Christianity or religion is, oh, I'm unworthy, I'm no good, I'm no good. Religion, that's it. No, there's no, everywhere you turn, everywhere you turn in scripture, he is elevating. He demands, look at me eye to eye, face to face. I elevate you, not make you grovel. I don't push you down and say you're no good. I raise you up and say you've never discovered yet who you are. Come and find yourself in me. You see, that's metanoia. I think we'll have to talk about that some other time. time. But it says there's joy in heaven over the metanoia of a sinner. I've laughed at that because... Um, it says that about the coin, when the coin is lost. Well, that coin did not have an exchange of mind, did it? Didn't, didn't even have a, a mind change. Nor, nor did the sheep, if you want to really press it. What's it mean? The metanoia, that exchange of mind uh, of the sheep for the shepherd, the, the mind of the sheep has been confronted by the mind of the shepherd. The mind of the sheep says, give me the wilderness. The mind of the shepherd is, you are beloved, you matter, you're coming home. And I'm taking you. And I'll take you whatever it takes because you are loved. That's the mind of the shepherd. Well, you see, when that sheep was embraced and put on the shoulder, the sheep was brought into and under the authority of the mind of the shepherd. And we're going to go backwards. We are going to leave this wilderness and leave your mind here. And, and you're going to resurrect into the mind of the shepherd. And this is going to be your home. Metanoia. See, repentance, that hideous word, is, is not how sorry I am and I shouldn't have done it. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I won't do it again. I promise I won't beat me, beat me. I'm no good. I'm unworthy. No, that is the meaning of the word repentance, but it's not the meaning of the Greek word that repentance is supposed to translate. 
No, the metanoia is that I confronted the mind of God in Jesus Christ. I confronted God and he's absolutely other than I thought he was. He loves me. He's kind, he's gentle, and I of such importance he would become human in order to carry me into the Holy Trinity family. I confront that mind of God, and in confronted it in the Holy Spirit, I bring my mind, well, my mind just collapses in the light of that mind. I discover my mind is a bunch of lies. My mind is a bunch of darkness. And I surrender to the mind of God. I'm carried home in the mind of God, who is Jesus. There was only one set of footprints going out of the wilderness because the sheep didn't follow behind, didn't walk beside. He was on the shoulders. As I said, the closest thing we'll get to in. For me to live is Christ. Not for me to be forgiven. For me to live That is every detail of life for me to live is Christ. Christ who is my life. I live, yet not I. It is Christ who lives in me. There you have it, you see. There you have it. And he came out of the wilderness beside himself with joy. The joy that started there when he found the sheep. Now it goes crazy. And he's calling his neighbors, rejoice with me, rejoice with me. I found my sheep. I found my sheep. That's where the Holy Spirit that we spoke of last week, he comes and he opens our eyes to who we are, opens our eyes to what has happened and fills with joy. The word rejoice, stronger than joy, it always suggests a celebration. In the word rejoice, there's a suggestion of a party, a strong suggestion of dancing, singing. Rejoice. Because we're home. At home. I'm going to read the scripture and then we're done. Titus 3, 3. For we also once were foolish. Foolish ourselves. We were disobedient. We were deceived. We were enslaved to various lusts and pleasures. Spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the you have it, the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared just like that shepherd. His face came over the rock and he was there. And it says appeared. And the word there is um, epiphania. It, it, It means the blaze of light. So suddenly into our darkness came the kindness and love of God like a blaze of light. He saved us, not on the basis of any deeds which we have done, but according to his mercy, and that mercy and loving kindness, compassion, by the washing of regeneration, he gave you the bath of all baths, renewing a new mind, by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly to Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we will be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's it. And now the blessing of God, almighty love, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that blessing embrace you, possess you, open your eyes and cause you to know that you are safe on the shoulders of the God-man, Jesus. So I bless you, and that is the way it is. Amen.